the head. Here's my props. We're going to talk about the head. Immensely uh, difficult part of the body and unfortunately the most important part. Because when we talk, we look eye to eye. And it's a place to get the greatest emotions. The eyes are the window of the soul. The whole face is. It's communicating all the time. The body does too. It has body language. But here is particularly critical because if we're going to connect emotionally and feel close together, we have to look at each other. I'll look in the camera eye to eye. And that that kind of love stare, you'll see that in love movies where the two soon to be lovers by the end of two hours look across the room. It's actually called in the uh, in screenwriting tropes or not even screenwriting, writing tropes, the look or the stare. You look across and they see each other and boom, the audience instantly knows they're going to be together by the end of the novel or if it's a tragedy, sorry, not, not going to happen. But in any case, the connection is face to face, head to head, eyes to eyes. Likewise, aggression is the same way. If you try and stare a dog in the eyes that doesn't know you, it might growl and bite you because it, it thinks you're being aggressive when you get in there and look. And so that face can evoke very quickly fear or comfort, depending on the circumstances. It's a powerful tool. If we have a beautiful big landscape, a little farmer in the field, and we can see his face, we'll go as quick as we can past all the beautiful lush landscape to the body, to the head, if we can see him to the eyes. We're that connected with it. So it's a critical part of who we are. And if I uh, search for drawing, and I do this to see what kind of uh, um, value posts and free lessons to, to put out there for folks to see what they're interested in, head drawing's much more popular than figure drawing. And yet it's a lot harder. Usually we're, we're lazy folks most of the time. We want to do the easy stuff. Not here. This is critical. So when we look at the head, we're starting with this skeleton. It's immensely complicated. Oh, my God. Look at all that. I can even put my fingers through the cheekbone holes here. What the hell is going on with that? And then if we layer it with muscle and tendon to hide or complement the bones, it gets even more complicated. And what we need to do then is find a way into that difficulty, that complication. We spend our whole life looking at ourselves in the mirror, looking at others as they talk to us. We know heads very well, and yet we know them in an unconscious way. That's enough for your audience to realize you're not doing it right. I'm not interested. Or that's amazing. That's, that's exactly, I can feel the emotion in that face. And it may not be through the lens of realism, but it'll be some truth, some filter of truth. So we know the head very well, and yet we know it unconsciously, which means we don't know how to draw it intuitively. A little kid or a primitive piece of art will be this way because it's just a silhouette, and it will be a very poorly drawn silhouette in terms of what a realist might think. And the eye will be a front of the eye because it's the most characteristic view of the eyes. And the shoulders will be turned front, even though the head's turned to the side. Again, the most characteristic. What we know as an animal is a silhouette. Is it a big silhouette? If you're out, I live close to Yellowstone Park in Montana here. <clears throat> if you're out hiking in Yellowstone Park and a bear sees you, they tell you don't run because you'll get chased. Get your backpack and hold it up over your head so you get a big silhouette Then they don't want to mess with you. If you get down low, the, the hackles, we got a little dog that's this big. We have a big dog that's this big too, but a little dog that's this big. When it hears a car drive up, the hackles will go up to make it bigger. A cat will puff out, tail will puff out even to make it bigger, more threatening. We know the silhouettes. As a little baby, we'll learn to see that the mobile is separate from us. That silhouette is not connected. The world is disconnected to us. And emotionally, that's a, that's a big drop for us. It's a bit of a tragedy for us. And my view is we spend the rest of our life, one way or another, trying to connect back. We artists get to help them do that. But most of the time, we live as survivalists, like the reptile, fighting, freezing up, or running away from things. And when we take it in, it's just at a glance. Oh, that's a dog, not a wolf. That dog's wagging its tail. It's not got its hackles up. It's not baring its teeth. I don't have to worry about it. I don't see it. 
I just recognize the silhouette, dog, rabbit, skyscraper, Mack truck, too close. And that kind of silhouette thinking is the way we survive. If I put up my hood, uh, if I had a hood, my dogs will bark at me because they don't recognize my silhouette when I walk in the door. So one of the things we artists have to do is learn to see the world in a very conscious way and a strategic way. And ideally, if we're using art in its deepest, pow most powerful way, in a connective way, because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to, we were taught that we are no longer connected to the world. We came out of the womb or we came out of heaven or nirvana or source energy or the quantum soup connected and now we're incarnated, biologically or spiritually, disconnected. Art is one of the few things to, that reconnects. We have to get conscious here, and we have to get conscious aware here to really feel like we have a fulfilling life. And likewise, I believe, to have really, truly wonderful art here and here. So we're going to talk a little bit about both, quite a bit up here, because we're going to talk about some of the engineering today. But I want you to be aware our job is to get more conscious day to day and not walk around in survival mode, not noticing that the flowers have bloomed in the, the uh, neighbor's yard, not uh, noticing that there's this beautiful fog as there was this morning uh, in, in our, uh, in our uh, town here, in our property where all the trees were misted back, going back into this ghostly, beautiful, silvery, sparkling silhouette of snow and ice and steam from a nearby river coming off. It was glorious. A lot of people wouldn't notice that. So we're going to get very conscious about the head. And then we'll even play with a few things as we move through this on how to make this and this come together so that we can do art that not only looks right, feels right, rings true, super real, or beautifully stylized, or whatever our goal is. Not only that, but they can connect to people. Boy, there's something about the way she drew that head. I don't know what it is, but I sure like it. That's what we want, I think. I don't care if I'm the best craftsman, draw the best head or the best eye. I want to be as good as I can, but I want to get them here. Something about that that is different, that rings more true to me, that connects me somehow. So anyway, that's my little uh, uh, prologue. So we're going to move into the head. And our goal is to take all this complexity that I just showed you and all those powerful words, thoughtful words, and maybe overwhelming, intimidating words, and reduce it down to a simple couple ideas. I call them filters. And then we're going to play with them, but we're going to play with them strategically. I call those iterations. If we can learn to see everything as simply as we possibly can and then play with it to see exactly where the sweet spot is, that's it. That's That looks great. Then we're going to be really in great, great shape. So let me um, look out of that. I don't know what's going on there. Something weird is going on with that, but I'm going to steal this. It's popping at me. And put this guy over here, since it's not a nude, I'm going to be able to show it. So that's a treat, because usually YouTube won't let me do that. Okay, so I'm going to do a, a bit of a tease here with the uh, sketching. And let me just take a look, make sure we're still streaming. We're still good, I assume. Good, good, good. Okay, Merry Christmas to you. Uh, a log, uh, forgive me if I mispronounce that, but uh, that was sweet of you. Thank you. Okay, so let's sketch here. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to do a little sketch, and then we'll start to break this down. We'll see, see what we see here, and I'm just going to draw, and then we'll spend actually a lot of lessons. I think we'll probably do five or ten or maybe even 20 lessons where we really get into the head really, really carefully. Take it just as far as we can. Make a little course out of it. I haven't done that before. So let's do a little prettier color than that. What I'm trying to do is get down with every mark something that rings true and can be even more than true. 
I call it being more dynamic. And I know I'm not going to get it perfect. And actually, as a creative person who has my own unique voice, just as you all do, I don't want to get it just right. I want to get it my kind of right, not everybody's kind of right. So I'm going to push things more dynamic. I'm going to take the idea, whatever it is, and I'm going to screw it up on purpose, knowing I probably can't get it exactly right. I'm going to screw up in the right way. Knowing that shadows should be dark, but I'm not quite sure how dark, I'll try and make them a little too dark. Knowing that that thing is, that ribcage is going back in space, knowing I probably won't get it exactly right, I'll make it go back in space a little farther. <clears throat> knowing that the, the eyebrows drop ever so slightly one to the other, I'm going to drop them more. And I'm going to go through simple idea by simple idea and be conscious of those ideas when usually I'll spend my days, the hours in my day, unconscious. And as I move along, I'll add a new thing and I'll come back and check the other things so that the relationship is right. And whether it's going to be really simple and stylized like I, I did there, maybe that's my version of an anime drawing. I can't do those beautiful drawings the way some of you can, I'm sure. But let's say do kind of a little stylized drawing or whether it's going to be more realistic. I'll try and break it down. And each thing is in relationship, is connected to another. And everything is a composition, which means all the separate things, what we call oftentimes in figure drawings, the parts, and usually they're the jointed parts, the forearm is from wrist to elbow and so on. The parts, the composition is the parts in a beautiful relationship. If it's an aesthetic composition, which I'm an aesthetic artist, I like beautiful things, but it doesn't have to be that in your art. It can be um, judgmental things or, or warnings of, of, uh, of uh, dangerous things, whatever you want. Uh, but parts in relationship, and I'm going to shoot for beautiful relationships. So I want the parts in some whole connected. Again, that's what we artists, it's our job, is to connect. So the head in relationship to the body, if we were to draw it. The eyebrow in relationship to the eyebrow. Both eyebrows in relationship to the center line. And as we start building this out, what we'll find is it doesn't matter what we draw or how we draw it. It is through a kind of a sketchy, almost a, a comic book cartoon version of a head. But it could be a very realistic head, too. And it could be not just line, but tone, or it could be all tone. And everything is then in relationship. The shadow is in relationship to the light. And the light tends to be on the front of this particular face and the shadows tend to be on the side of this particular face. And even if we don't get it right, notice none of these are very, are truly close to right, but they're in a similar relationship that starts to make them somewhat fairly right, let's say. And if I can get the idea that every time I put a shadow in, it's going to show a side plane, a little bit of the side of the nose, a little bit of the inside of the eye socket against the bridge of the nose. If we could see at the far side, it's also a little bit of the underside here. And if it turns a little bit away, it gets a little darker. And if it turns a lot away, it gets a lot darker. 
And again, we can start with a very, taking a very complicated thing with a very simple logic, simple idea that every time something turns down or turns to the left, it gets a little darker. And if it turns strongly down or strongly to the left, it gets a lot darker. On and on and on. And then we can come back again and take it farther towards realism, farther towards accuracy, closer to that beautiful aesthetic design. Now I'm going to push this shape design even stronger. And so on and so on all the way through. So notice how from a few scratchy lines to kind of a cartoony version to starting to be structured in tone. And then if we had the time three hours later, pretty rendered, it's just one step on top of the next, one idea on top of the next. And each time I do it, I'll get clearer about it. So I'll take it to a certain level in my practice and I won't do all finishes. In fact, I won't usually mostly do finishes. I will, let me say that a little better. I won't do finishes very often. I'll do practice more often, just like a pro athlete would. I'm gonna be in the batting cage, just hitting balls, micro adjusting where that elbow is, how deep in the stance it is, how low my chin is and do that over and over and over again. And then when I'm actually in the game performing for the event to do the big finish, say for our art, for our show coming up in six months, then I've got all that groundwork to do. So I'll come back to this again. And I'll do it again. And maybe this time I'll draw smaller so I can do several practices And maybe I'll adjust my view of what right is. And maybe even adjust my construction. And it'll be a little better, a little worse. And then I'll do it again. Well, that didn't work so well. It's okay. I'm going to do it again. What if I did this? So notice what I'm doing here, just in terms of a practice style, a, pra a, a practice discipline, is I'm being patient and curious. What if I start out big and go quickly to rendered value? What if I go small and construct by a mask of a face and then stick on the features right away? What if I take the whole head and face and put it into one shape and then break away this simplified, simple but characteristic hairstyle and build that. What if I lift that chin a little bit? And sometimes it'll be worse. This was worse than the first one. This was worse than the, sec other than the first one. But I'm learning each time and I'm doing a lot of starts and not many finishes to get the simple characteristic, the big foundational ideas, like a athlete would, like a world-class performer would, like a carpenter would, the foundational things. And then things start to get a little better they start to ring a little truer. And I can then see progress and a way through from that simple yet characteristic beginning to maybe a finish someday soon. So we're going to work on a process to get from here to there but it won't be one process. I'm gonna try and show you what I tend to do 
And then I'm going to try and show you variations, playful ways to do it a little or a lot differently. I want a process so it's not overwhelming. I want one idea after another so it's not overwhelming. I'm going to look at the world with all its infinite complexity, really. The face and, and, and head and whole body with all its infinite complexity, really. And distill it down into one or two or five very simple ideas and play with those and learn to connect those. And let the, by being very conscious about those one or few ideas, those one or, fil two, one or few filters, I can be unconscious about the others. Or use this, the processes from the great masters or whatever uh, system I, I like out there, book or class. And take a little bit from that and a little bit from this and find what works and why find what works for me. What we want to do is get something that rings true. But what we really want to do in our art, what we as an audience really want to see in your art, to be more accurate, is not what is true, but what is your truth. Because they have, we have as an audience each, our own truth. And it's not completely working for us. We need help with that. We feel disconnected when we want to connect. We feel powerless when we want to be in control. We feel weak when we want to be strong. We don't, can't find our voice when we even have something to speak. Art helps us through all those things, like mystical and religious traditions try to do. It's connective strategies. So when we go to a movie or open a book or walk into a gallery or look at a, uh, a search on uh, beautiful illustrations on the internet, we're hoping we see the greatest art we've ever seen in my life. You wished every one of these drawings was way better than it was because you were hoping it was so good that it would lead you to some greater truth on how to do your own work. And none of them are all that good, but that's okay. We're gonna get better together as we go through and we're going to find out not how we can all do it like this guy, because then you'd just be a secondhand version of me. And I'm not where I want to be either. I've been for, I got 40 some years head start on you, and I'm still not where I want to be. Why follow me? Take a few things from me that connect to you, that feel right, and put those in to process and then play with them creatively so you can find a better way to do it Better than me, I hope, period, but certainly better than me for you, for your own benefit and your own process. So that's going to be our goal. So let's do a little bit of groundwork now on the how-to. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look for the simplest and darkest, the simplest yet the most characteristic structures of the head I can. When I look at a head, and eventually when I look at his head, what's the simplest shapes I can make that don't overwhelm me, that give me control, that I can animate literally or just make it in a more dynamic position, and yet be as characteristic of the finished product as I can? Simple yet characteristic. I want to be so characteristic that when I stop, you know it's this young man in a certain position with a certain mood, certain hairstyle, certain uh, quality of the flesh, whatever it is, and yet really simple. Those are opposing ideas. If it was fully characteristic, it'd be fully rendered, be photorealistic. Can't do that because too late to fix it if I'm 40 hours into it. If I make it super simple, it's just a snowman drawing. Well, that's simple. I can learn to do that. I can learn to teach other people to do that. But I can't take it any farther. And getting from there to over here is a big job. So when I think of things that are really simple, the shape or the form, Either way, we'll tend to do this, but we'll start with this oftentimes. When I think of the shape or the form, whichever I want to draw, 
I want to make it as simple as I can. And yet, even at that simple stage, it still rings true of at least a young male with a certain position in space, certain hairstyle, and maybe even uh, 10 or 15 minutes into it, a certain shadow pattern, certain direction to the light. Simple yet characteristic. So my goal, and I'll never quite get there probably, but my goal is <clears throat> if I had to stop, would I get with at ever whatever point, would it still ring true to what I had, or would it be a placeholder? So if I start with that head like this and had to stop, that didn't tell me anything about the head. I don't even know if it's a head or not. Certainly not the proportion of the head, certainly not the position. Don't know if it's male or female, young or old, black or white. But if I were to do something that's pretty much as simple. Now we're starting to get the idea that the is pretty well facing forward, the chin's down just ever so slightly. So there's a, a tilt down, if not a look down, a little bit. And it's more profiled in front. And then if I do another line, now we know it's a, a near three quarter. And if we do another line, now we know that we're ever so slightly on top of this head if we were to box it out and, and, and. Every time I add something, it makes it a little more characteristic, even though it's a simple step. It was just a, a center line down. It was just a T across the eyebrow. I just chiseled off the chin in the same axis of that. It was just a sailboat triangle. But if we get the right simple, it does a lot of good. So you're going to spend your whole career trying to simplify things down so you can get control of them and get creative with them. If I make it super simple, there's a lot of room to play. And my simple will hopefully be a little or a lot different than your simple. And then when I see your work, I go, oh, geez, I never thought of that. That's incredible. I love how that happens. That's what we want. That's what we want. Okay, so let's look at the head then. The head is more long than it is wide almost always, unless you're doing a caricature. And that's most of the body. Most of the body is long in length and relatively narrow in width all the way through with very few exceptions. And with very few exceptions, that long length from end to end connects to the next thing, end to end. The end of the upper arm begins the forearm. The end of the forearm begins the wrist and so on. And that's really helpful for us because as we draw the end of one thing, we actually have in the ending of that one thing, the seed of the beginning of the next thing. And then we can show the connection because as I finish the head, it's already setting me up in some way for the neck. And as I finish the neck, it's setting me up for some in some way for the torso and so on. So a simple idea. I'm going to try and really understand the long axis, the length, so that I can have a connective strategy. So whatever I'm drawing. As that ends, I'm already planning, thinking, have a process for creating the next thing. And now I'm composing, not just isolating. That long axis. <clears throat> and if it's not perfectly symmetrical, like a face looking right at you is, where none of us are perfectly symmetrical, but more or less. If it's not a symmetrical form, like shoulder to shoulder, nipple to nipple, you know, front of the torso and the head, but a little off axis or asymmetrical by design, like it is in the limbs or in a profile, then we're going to have a dynamic long axis, usually, meaning curved. Curve is wonderful. A marvel. A curve never ends. It's all one movement. Whereas a corner 
stops the eye. And we've got to start again. And we've got to start again. Start again. So the more curved it is, the more connected it is spatially. Feels connected. Water is connected. Even when the wave splashes up, it curls back down and reconnects to the whole ocean. And that's, again, a connective strategy. So curves make things graceful, connected, watery, energetic. Energy, if you kink, kink the hose, the water can't flow through the hose. It creates a corner. But if you open it up and let it be a gentle or not so gentle curve, then we have this beautiful grace. So anytime I can get a long axis curved, I will. And that's why when I drew that face that was in a profile and we turned it into a three quarter view, I curved those lines. Now each of these lines is organic and fluid, even though they do sometimes hit corners. We'll address that another time. But it's energetic. And as one thing ends, then it's gonna set the seed, as I said, for something else to begin. So the head is going to be relatively long. So I'll just stick with the snowman. I'll just make it a longer snowman. So here was the snowman. Now I've made it longer. That's an improvement. They're just as simple for the most part. But now we've got something that's a, a little more characteristic. It's long in length and relatively narrow in width. So we're starting to balance. I'm getting it really simple and somewhat characteristic. And if I could practice on the proportions of that, that would be another idea. I'm just going to draw it as an egg. I'm going to draw it, draw it as an egg that has a certain proportion of width I can spell proportion, width and length. It's a certain position. Maybe it's not leaning over, it's straight up and down or slightly. Slightly tilted, ever so slightly, and slightly looking to the right, ever so slightly. Notice how I'm just drawing a shape. We haven't even gotten into form. I'm just drawing a two-dimensional shape. It's one idea. What's the shape? Could that be the shape? Could that be the shape? I got enough to do. Just worrying about the shape. Then once I start to get something that starts to ring true, these two ring pretty true. That might be a little heavy, that might be a little long, but it's getting there. Pretty good. Now, it's not that it shouldn't be an egg. I like that egg, but it could be a little less chubby in the jaw, a little less long in the chin. So that feels like it's pretty good. Now the position, it actually wasn't turning away, it was facing straight towards us, and it wasn't leaning slightly, it was straight on at attention to us. And so then I'll work on that. And now, now, notice, now notice how I'm stacking complexity, that if I started with that, might be overwhelming. But as I ease into it gently, as I'm teaching a child next to me at the drawing table, Here's what you do, sweetheart. No worries. Oh, that's great. I love, you know, it, I just love this line quality, the energy you drew that. Well, she screwed up all three of these. She didn't get the egg. She just made a ball. She didn't get the proportions. She didn't get the position, but you didn't say that to that sweet little soul. You gave her compliments and you met it. Look at the energy of the line. Look at the fearlessness that you put down. Look at the beautiful color of crayon you choose to draw it with. Give praise to that sweet child who just wants to play and have fun and is creative by design until we, she gets talked out of it. He gets talked out of it. 
and do the same thing for yourself. Ease into it. Praise, I meant to say. Praise. <laughs> okay. Give her a phrase of praise. How's that? Feel myself out there. So that's what I'm going to do. Step by step, I'm going to add to it. And then instead of line, I might add decide to add tone. Instead of no light, I might add a direct light source. Instead of flat, I might add three-dimensional. Replace it with a true egg and not just an ellipse. On top of, on top of, on top of. Where I get really more characteristic is when I can combine several different shapes. Usually we consider them these three, a box, a tube, or a ball or egg. If I can combine all three of these, two, you can turn them into two-dimensional ideas or three-dimensional ideas. They can be tapering or not, different proportions or not, right-angled Christmas boxes or not. But you start adding those together, mashing those up, connecting what is seemingly different things together to its own connective strategy. So what I'll do when I start getting fairly confident, well, that's pretty close to a front of a face. And next time we'll go through proportions and stuff. That's pretty close to it. But what if I could make the bottom of that a little more boxy? Oh, that looks a little more male to me. This looks a little more feminine or a little younger or whatever. What if I could make it uh, more capsule-like? Combining a ball, capping a tube, and then more boxy. Or not completely boxy, but just slightly more chiseled. Still with curved lines. What if I could taper these sides and not make them parallel so it's a little bit more conical, more refined, more characteristic tube? Notice how each time I had another idea, I did another drawing. That's the iterations. I don't say, well, maybe this should be more up. Up, uh, upright or more tilted and just erase and draw. Now I'll do another one right next to it. Maybe it should be shorter. I'll do another one. Shorter and a little chubbier maybe. I'll do a brand new version of the same thing. Trying to make it ever more characteristic step by step by step. And now once I get to the big finish, you go, ah, that's it. That is what I'm looking for. I know exactly how I got there. But if I keep erasing this and redrawing and erasing it and redrawing, and it turns out to be the best hit I've ever drawn, I may not know how to get there again. So I want to give myself my own step-by-step -step process to how I get it better and better and better. And likewise, if I keep going and it ends up being a mess, really screwed it up, I can go back. Here's it's uh, step 85. I can go back to 42 when it was looking great and say, oh, that's what happened. I lost the symmetry or the uh, all the rendering destroyed the simple shadow shapes or whatever it was. Now I've got a much better way to do it. I get very curious about what I see. And then I try and find the best, simplest, most characteristic answer I can. Curiosity keeps you coming back over and over and over. 
get curious and say, I'm going to redraw it again, really at the simple stage, before it's anything much, before I, I'm uh, not emotionally connected to it, well, it's the best eye I ever drew. It's way off over here. It looks like Quasimodo, but it's a great eye. I'll do everything not to have to fix that eye. But if I start out in the beginning at this stage and something isn't right, it's not a tragedy at all. It's just an opportunity to fix it. Oh, I see. That needs to be a little longer. Oh, I see. That needs to be a little square. I see. That needs to taper a little bit more. So that's going to be the process we use to discover. And notice how conscious we are. I'm curious, that's engaging my intellect. It's engaging my eyes. It's taking everything there and distilling it down to, into one simple idea or three or four simple ideas and then having it translate out on the paper. And then being curious enough to try it again and try it again and make it work as well as I can at the beginning level before I'm five hours into it. 40 hours into it, and then I'm frustrated. Then I'm overwhelmed. Then I feel like, what's the point? I'm going to do another 20 hours on another one and screw it up again. I might as well give up. This, if you can learn to love the process, if you can learn to love just swinging and not being at the big event, not being at the one-man show, getting hugs and congratulations, but being in the studio with dirty fingernails and charcoal on your face that your kids don't tell you is on there until three hours later, and which happens all the time and love the process, love to hit the speed bag, love to jump the rope, love to just make marks on the back of the envelope or doodles in my sketchbook that are just free and playful or curious and, and interested while Steve gets his act together and gets the live stream going. Take those little moments just to play with these things throughout your week. And then all of a sudden, this curiosity this interest and this strategy that you're developing now can play out not just after work on the weekends, but throughout your waking life. You can become conscious as an artist while you're waiting for the bus, while you're waiting for the live stream, while you're uh, waiting for your coffee to brew or your tea to steep, whatever it is. And now those little wasted moments are creative moments while you wait for the, the, the bagel at the bakery. And then you look at the beautiful light cutting through and lighting up those pastries and the cast shadows and the reflected light in front and the bright color iced in front. I'm getting hungry already. And all of a sudden I'm thinking like an artist while I'm just waiting for my breakfast or my lunch or whatever. All right. So I think we will stop there. Let me pop over here and check out. It's buffering quite a bit. Well, I'm sorry for that. So I will have a recording for that uh, and I'll stick it up there um, as soon as I can. <laughs> Puerto Rico here, always ready for coffee. I agree with you, Oscar. Um, how would you approach a drawing slash painting in which the subject was more inherently stiff, less graceful? Uh, for example, Frankenstein or a weightlifter. It's a great question, uh, BZ Cheen. I love that. <laughs> uh, that's a great question. That's filters too. That's an idea too. So I said, if we can draw that long axis curve, we can make it more graceful. How graceful do you want it? Well, if it's something that's half alive, not fully fluidly alive, like a Frankenstein, maybe you want to take that, that curve out of that. What we'll learn as we go through this process is the filters that I talk about, just an egg shape, just a box, just a ball, just a, a two value system for light and shadow. All these real simple ideas, taking complexity and simplify it are also immensely creative, especially when we pair opposites together, light and shadow, ball and box, realism and abstraction. Uh, detail and painterly technique, uh, tone and line, uh, soft edges and hard and lost. So all of a sudden we can take those opposites. Most people walk around thinking opposites are dangerous. I'm right, you're wrong. I'm safe because I'm inside and you're out. You've been pushed out. We live like this to protect ourselves. We, we need our space. 
We need to stay separate for the world, even as we emotionally desperately need to be connected. Artists have connective strategies. The way I define those is, and it can be defined lots of different ways, is by filters. I'm going to try and bring abstraction into the realism, energy into the matter, um, <clears throat> line into the tone, uh, flatness into, against space, uh, losing the difference between light and shadow and foreground and background when realism would say we want to, we want to keep it. So I'll play games between those choices, knowing that there's an extreme range within that choice of how light and how dark, how red and how green. And I'll play all the way between and through to find the perfect sweet spot. And most of the time I'll stick with the conservative realist choice that all my favorite artists did. Every once in a while I'll do something that's very different that a particular favorite artist did that nobody else did or a school of artists did that no other school did. And I'll steal from that, and then I'll steal over here from that. But it'll almost always be a range. That's where it's super powerful, is how stiff or how fluid you want it, how confident or how nervous do you want it, how complex or how simple do you want it. It doesn't have to be one answer. It can evolve. It can get more and more simple as it goes down away from the light, and more and more simple as it turns back into the shadow. And thicker and thicker paint to thinner paint. And blended paint to drawn line. And full value ranges to no value ranges. And brighter colors to, to uh, browner colors. That's all Rembrandt. Harder edges to softer edges. <clears throat> More value range to less value range. Every one of those filters is an idea between more or less. And every one of those is exactly what Rembrandt did in his work. In fact, all those Brown School artists did in their work, like Van Dyck or Da Vinci. And that's what defines their style. That's how we recognize them. We love them for their creative choices that are a little different than the folks who came before. So what you do is you learn to play creatively. You learn to play. You're curious and having fun like a four-year-old. But also in the back of the, your mind, you have a strategy like an adult. It's for this. I'm going to play, but I'm going to play with a little bit of discipline to see where my comfort zone is and to find that comfort zone in how stiff or how fluid. I'll go way outside of it in my simple, crude sketches where I'm not emotionally attached, where most realists will do this much. Well, it's not tipping quite there, there it is. That's perfect, right? So they would have gone two, two degrees at most to find perfect straight. I'll play way over here. Klimp played way over here. He broke their necks sometimes with the models to get them over. The creative folks play way outside the, the range, and then they come back and usually aren't very far off realism, but enough to make it unique and different, to attract attention, to take, make the old thing new again.